You're listening to Body IO FM with your hosts, Kiefer and Dr. Rocky, where cutting edge science meets the razor's edge of health and performance. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Body IOFM. This is your host, Kiefer, with co host Dr. Rocky Patel. Rocky? Hello. <laughs> uh, today, we're going to be doing another research review. Uh, we, of course, want to mention our sponsor, Elite Athletic Wear. Check them out. There's a discount code for 25% off your first purchase from them at uh, body.io. You can find it off there on the uh, right-hand side. And, um, and we're doing, since we're doing the research review again, we brought Alex Moore back on who's doing his, uh, I'm pretty sure, doctoral thesis at the moment at Arizona State University. In, uh, go ahead. Uh, what, what's your Post, specialty right now? Postprandial lipemia, the fun stuff. So eh, for those of you who don't know, that's basically what happens with uh, the fat content in your, your blood, cholesterol, triglyceride levels, all that kind of stuff after a meal. Um, particularly, I think his specialty is in diseased states. Uh, normally, we won't, you don't want to see large uh, influxes of fatty acids and them not being able to be disposed or triglycerides. And that's what he's looking at in the populations that he's he's studying. And we're gonna jump right into it. Uh, we we don't have any preliminaries this time. It's just straight up research. And this this first one, uh, Alex kind of uh, pulled it out of his 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 ass basically right before the show. So Rocky and I just got a chance to kind of review it quickly. Um, and he's gonna go into a little more detail, but. It's, it looks at the controversy, you know, I know recently, especially with the paleo movement, there's been this huge push towards, you know, you need to make sure you get uh, butter from pasture raised cows. Uh, they often call it pasture, uh, uh, grass fed butter, which I think is just one of the stupidest terms ever. How do you get butter to eat grass? Um, and, you know, the, the idea being that it's got to be healthier because the cows were raised on grass. And I, I would, I would follow that line of logic for the actual animal products themselves, like for example the beef liver, or the musculature of the animal, or whatever organs you might consume. But I don't think there's any reason, distinctly, to think that that's going to be true of any milk products. Uh, there, there's sort of an insulary layer there of what's going to come out, particularly in the fat products. So this study examined the difference between butter from cows that were pasture raised and the standard. What's the term conventional? Conventional in uh, unfortunately is Danish cows, so I don't know what their conventional um, husbandry is for cows. The, the farm is, is yeah. it like our farm raised? So the feed or what's called fodder, mm -hmm. it's it's quite different from what we conventionally use here in America. We use a lot of corn. Um, they use a lot of different types of grains that are more um, akin to Europe and also with the addition of uh, rapeseed, which is where you actually get canola oil from. And see, and, and that could skew things right there because rapeseed already has a higher omega-3 content, which is one of the things that U.S. cows do not get in their diet from the grain-fed grain diets that we give them here. Sure, we have to be a little bit careful with the context, but I think this still gives us uh, a pretty clear picture as far as what is generally termed, you know, conventional or feeding the cattle grain and what we're going to get um, from the product like butter or dairy um, in, in comparison to pasture raised or what general people here call grass fed. So this was a double blind randomized controlled study that lasted 12 weeks. They compared... Um, 39 grams of fat from butter from conventional and pasture origin, and they examine the risk factors on metabolic syndrome. So um, just as in with humans, the cow's digestive tract, their microflora, which is generally what we, we term um, uh, gut bacteria, will take on certain um, characteristics and produce certain types of compounds in response to their, the types of diets that they're eating. So the digestive tract of a cow is pretty complex. It has the, the rumen where they digest a lot of the grasses and so forth that 
um, that they've uh, adapted to over time. And there's this certain substance that is produced in response to a diet that's high in chlorophyll or high in grass. It's called phytanic acid. So phytanic acid, it has this agonist activity on, I'm going to give you some complex terms here, but retinoid X receptor and peroxisome proliferator activated receptor alpha. What you really need to know PPR is... PPAR alpha, alpha. Right, yeah. yeah. Some of you might be familiar with the PPAR gamma. Um, it's It's been in uh, it's news recently in some people's articles. So. But the implications for for us here is that it it's supposed to have uh, induced glucose uptake. So the idea behind looking at these biomarkers for metabolic syndrome was it might have um, um, some insulin sensitizing effects that, which would help alleviate a lot of symptoms associated with metabolic syndrome. So this was a very well, I thought it was a very well conducted study. It was done for 12 weeks. Um, they had good compliance and compliance wasn't measured by diet, uh, a diet diary, if you will, but they actually looked at plasma um, uh, pentadoic acid, a marker of, of milk fat. So that's already a, a pretty good uh, part in the design. Um, and it was a pretty homogenous subject pool. It was done in healthy adults. What they found was there was no, after 12 weeks, there was no difference in, in the metabolic parameters um, between either group. So did they look at what, what potentially so, were the differences between um, the the cons- the constituent components of the milk fat between the two cows. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, if you, if if you actually want to break down saturated fat, monounsaturated fat and polyunsaturated fat, when you compare the grass, the, well, this current grass fed from here on out was 59% saturated fat versus 64% saturated fat in the conventional. The monounsaturated fat in the grass fed was 31% compared to 27%. In the conventional and the PUFAs or the polyunsaturated were the same at three percent, so there was really not much of a discrepancy between the percentages. Now, when you actually look at the saturated fat content, and particularly the types of saturated fat that were in um, the conventional, the conventional butter, they had more uh, lauric, myristic, and palmitic acid. So in the uh, in the grass-fed butter, this, these were actually decreased by twenty percent. Yet there was still no effect on total or LDL um, um, concentrations between either group. So I, I'm just looking up to see if the, you know, the, my my big issue with this study at the moment would be wondering uh, how big of a difference that rapeseed made uh, compared to the corn. And, and and it, it it could be little because especially since the polyunsaturated fatty yeah. acid content was so minimal to begin with. Well, when you look at the actual fodder, don't quote me on this number because I don't have the study in front of me, but I believe it was under, I believe it was under thirty percent. Um, so it wasn't a large constituent of the feed. Um, but again, you know, something around that percentage is is could have a noticeable effect. Right. Like I said, I'm just curious if that was, I'm I'm actually looking up the composition of butter from U.S. dairy cows raised conventionally at the moment. Uh, And what were the numbers you gave? So we've got 59 versus 64 for saturated fat. Hold on, hold on. So U.S. saturated is in the 50s, like 51 to 50 for saturated fat. For the monounsaturated fat, it was 31 to 27. Okay, U.S. dairy butter is crappier in that regards. It's only in the 20 range, 21 to 23. And then the PUFAs were 3 and 3, so the same. Same as, yeah, U.S. dairy is also 3 and 3. Uh, did it have trans fat content? We actually have uh, the trans fat content of U.S. butter here, which is about I believe three. the conjugated linoleic acid was a little bit higher in the... In the uh, pasture raised but i don't have the paper so i can't tell you offhand okay which isn't a big big deal cla most people don't even realize uh conjugated linolytic acid which is sold as a supplement in the u.s is actually a trans fat um if you've ever read the i think it's called the ab diet or abs diet by brian zinzenko he says that trans fats are totally artificial and they don't exist exist anywhere in nature and they poison us and kill us (laughs) and then he recommends taking cla which is a naturally occurring trans fat um so just to show the idiocy of experts that are out there 
uh, so so the the trans fat that would be in butter is probably of no consequence whatsoever. So it, it's really interesting. U.S. butter is uh, does have a different makeup, and it would actually look like U.S. butter is healthier if you were to go by U.S. standards, which looks only at saturated fat because it it does have lower saturated fat content. Correct. Correct. From what you said, so. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting. It would be awesome if we could get this exact same study done here in the U.S. Yeah. With, with U.S. dairy cows. Just to see if there, there's any deviation at all. I mean, this is a great eye-opener that, okay, grass-fed may not, and looks like likely is not, advantageous. Well, one of the main reasons people kind of advocate it is these, these, um, these other bioactive substances such as phytanic acid, which was much higher in the, in the grass-fed cattle, but it really had... No measurable effect. No effect at all. Over 12 weeks, which in... You know what? In, I, oh, go ahead, Rocky. I, I would say, you know, what was interesting, though, is what they noticed in the study was that the baseline phytanic acid content correlated with higher LDL and higher total cholesterol. So, um, you know, to come back to the PPAR alpha, PPAR gamma, nuclear transcription factors, um, to bring this back to a medical standpoint, this is like the pharmaceutical holy grail trying to leverage these transcription factors to help treat diabetics because they increase insulin sensitivity and they help the liver process all this stuff. And so you have two drugs on the market currently, rosiglazone and pegalazone. They go by the brand names of Avandia and Actos that are on the market. Um, Actos or pegalazone um, is primarily a PPAR gamma antagonist and um, has weak alpha antagonists. But what you see when you, when patients go on these, these medications is they actually will get a better triglyceride and better HDL ratio because of what you see with this. So, you know, it's an interesting thought in terms of um, what you see with some of these kind of natural components and how they're leveraging these these factors. Um, unfortunately, the pharmaceutical industry has um, not been able to successfully kind of mimic these type of natural effects without having bad um, cardiovascular risk that goes along with them. So, um, so it is interesting, but it, like you said, I think it would be excellent to see a study with um, cows um, that are um, American or here in the States from, uh, in terms of their feed. That would be really the study to look at. Yeah, and, and it, it could end up being the same because this was a null result, right? I mean, it didn't matter if right. the bioactive components were in higher concentration or not. There was no difference, you know, in the, in the two. Yeah, at the end of the study. Right. Yeah. So it, it just it might be totally moot. Um, uh, looking at these things, uh, do, do we have any other comments about that one? No. Rocky. Oh, I don't know. Do I, so I, do I just saw my stock and carry gold now? Should I, is that what uh, I should yeah, do now? Maybe <laughs> I, you know, I just, uh, you know, I, I don't know what the advantage would be if you just, I have to admit carry gold butter does taste better. There's, there's something palpable there that. Uh, palatable there that is not what I find in say like Landa Lakes butter which I actually enjoy their sweet cream but I, I think the Kerrygold honestly tastes better so if it's a matter of palate then go for the more expensive stuff but if you think you're getting some kind of magic health benefit uh, like a la the bullshit exec um, you know it just may not be true absolutely anything, anything else I think that's about it. I was just surprised that there's no difference. That was really kind of the the amazing thing about it. That you know, even even I think um, uh, was it they check inflammation markers? I don't remember. Yeah, they uh, checked yeah. the CRP. Yeah, did, did, did CRP. Yeah. I, mean, was, I mean, that's just you know. But again, like I said, um, you know, you had to. I think the big point here is the the feed that was in the conventional cows there, and how different that feed is from American cows, obviously. So, right. But, you know, given the the exact null result here. Um, one would have to think that it probably is going to be similar here. Yeah, and, and you know the the interesting thing was is there there was a difference in the butter. There was a chemical difference in the butter. So you know it's just it looks like that chemical difference just doesn't mean anything. And thirty nine grams. This is a substantial amount to to a diet. Yeah, it's it's not like it was minuscule or something to be ignored. So all right, let's move on. What are what one are we hitting next? I, I, I think uh, I'm going to lead in with the effects of glycogen avail uh, availability on human skeletal muscle protein turnover during exercise and recovery. 
Um, and this is, you know, to me, one of the uh, a key kind of piece of research leading in the direction of explaining why car backloading works and why the conversations I've been having recently about how it's very, very important to rely on your intramuscular glycogen stores rather than trying to feed yourself for a workout during that workout. And um, th this also helps to explain why we don't see certain effects. Uh, for example, the research review done by Brad Schoenfeld and uh, Alan Aragon, th they tried to look at ingesting carbohydrates post-workout, and they were trying to basically piss all over the GLUT4 hypothesis that I put forward and, you know, carb backloading. And unfortunately, they just, they kind of showed their ignorance in what it was that they were trying to look at and compare. Uh, and they missed the point in fact, which is that intramuscular glycogen stores, like I say in the book, are the key factor uh, in making this work. So the insulin surge is to help you um, fight inflammation and, and other potential effects from the training. Um, but more importantly, the glycogen that you're trying to replete is incredibly important for the next day's training session. And as this study points out, it's also critical for the for muscle protein synthesis and to prevent muscle protein breakdown. So what what they did in this study, which was very, very interesting to me, is they took how many subjects? Six, was they had it? six subjects. They had six subjects. So it was a small, small pool. But the thing that made it interesting was that those six subjects, they did they they did it per leg. Uh, right? uh, both legs. They did both legs. Yeah, both legs. Yeah. It was a crossover. It sounded right. very painful. Right, right, right. So there were a lot of uh, unfortunately biopsy marks that were probably left on these legs. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna have to get my notes on this one. So they they wiped out basically they wiped out glycogen stores through some sort of you know glycogen depleting exercise, and then the follow up. One group went back on a high carbohydrate diet or medium carbohydrate diet, and the other it was went pretty on, high. It was seventy one percent of kcal. Yeah, and the other group was on a very on a low carbohydrate diet. So, in order to not allow them to replete glycogen stores, and then they retested, uh, and they actually looked for in this study. It was very well done because they looked at the turnover rates for leucine and phenylalanine, which and they used radioactive markers so they could both tell the synthesis rate of new muscle protein and also the rate of degradation from exercise. So they could actually compare those two rates. Yeah, these infusion studies are kind of hard to come by. I would have liked to have seen a little bit more as far as the subject code, but luckily they used a crossover design. Yeah. yeah, and in this, what they found was having full glycogen stores really was the trigger to increase muscle protein synthesis and help to ablate muscle protein breakdown. Uh, and, and it was f from, you know, unfortunately a limited number of people, but what we see is the available glycogen stores was what was the differentiating factor. And I'm, I'm not clear, I, w I got a little confused on their experimental procedure because of the way they talked about glucose uptake during exercise, were they providing glucose to the, no, 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 they were not. That's why I was a little confused. Cause they, they talked about the low carb group. They had higher glucose, glucose uptake, which must've meant that their liver was dumping more, more glucose than the other group. And that did not help in that situation with the muscle protein breakdown or to help increase synthesis. So, so it really is key to make sure those muscle glycogen stores are full when you're going into your training session. This is important and also another problem that we see with trying to obtain hypertrophy on a low-carb ketogenic diet. Um, it's not going to work out very well for you. So my question then would be is, um, you know, would you take someone who's on carb night and maybe – readjust the way that they're training and oh, for if they're sure. do larger lar larger groups do your larger groups day one day two post carb night and do smaller groups maybe 
later on in the week or maybe not even train hard past day three. Well, you know, for one, that's one of his thing people don't realize is Shockwave was designed for a, a ketogenic diet. It's It tries to get maximum stimulants in a minimum amount of time without the downside. And it it's it's made so you don't overtrain, basically. You're not going to get much bigger when you're on a ketogenic diet. It's just not going to happen. Um, so, you know, I would very definitely change their training. You know, Shockwave was specifically designed for that. It's a very minimal dosage to at least prevent you from losing any muscle mass during your dieting now or during your fat loss or whatever your goals are. Now to address your other point of would I move their bigger body parts to the end of the week or um, maybe to the beginning of the week after a carb night, I do do that with stage competitors. Their weakest body part, um, y- you know, and I'm, I might have actually had it wrong sometimes. Uh, usually. Sometimes, depending on their schedule, I would have them train their weakest body part on Saturday because Saturday night was their carb night and they were taking Sunday off, which could have been the wrong methodology. But others would have gotten the benefit because they would do their carb night on Friday and I would actually have them do one of their heavier workouts on Saturday. So that group probably got more benefit um, due to just my ignorance. I mean, this study wasn't in existence um, and I... Right. I wasn't tuning it well enough or putting enough thought into, you know, where carb backloading overlaps and could benefit somebody on carb night with a specific goal. I mean, that, the way I read the study is in the way I would interpret it, if someone is on carb night and you're doing shockwave, probably to optimize it. And the question is really how much optimization is it? You know, and that's to be questioned. But if you were to quote unquote optimize it, I would think that if you did carb night on Saturday and you're doing shockwave, Sunday and Monday is probably going to be either back and leg or back leg and then chest on a third day or something to that effect. And you're doing maybe the ab or the shoulder tries, you know, later on in the week. See, if it were, if I were going to opt, like totally optimize it, I would probably say, you know, if they're carb night Saturday night, they take Sunday off uh, because you do have this kind of refractory period when you're still protecting those glycogen stores that you just uh, replenished after a week of no carbs. And then Monday, I would actually have them like blow it out a two hour shockwave session. And then the rest of the week would be just medium level cardio. You know, there's a lot of research showing that the amount of recovery time you get is more important than not spending too much time in the gym. So it would be better to be in the gym two to three hours and not work out the rest of the week than to possibly try to train every day. So if I were going to try to optimize it for somebody and kind of run a little experiment, that is the experiment I would run to see what would happen. And then, you know, the rest of the week leading up to carb night would just be kind of mid-level cardio. Interesting that you say Walking, that. Walking, a little cycling, something pretty easy to do. Yeah. yeah. Or, so it makes sense. Yeah. What were you going to say, Alex? I said interesting that you say that too, to wait two days because that's actually how the study was designed. They actually did it right. at 48 hours or uh, I believe it was 46 hours um, after – the uh, initial uh, when, the, when the patients came in so yeah when you when you replete glycogen stores especially if you've been ketogenic uh, your body actually is trying to protect using those for the next 24 to 48 hours um, so you know it, it would be best to try to work with your body's rhythms and that's why I would say wait wait the 48 hours and with the uh, the medium intensity um, cardiovascular work is that to increase AMPK uh, you know really it's just to keep active uh, keep moving and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to go down to that specific of a level. I mean, really like you got all the effects you needed from the training session, like anything AMP, AMPK activation or whatever you're going to get from walking and medium is going to be pretty insignificant. It's really just to keep active and keep your, your cardiovascular up. Really something that a lot of people want. Yes, yes, very much so, especially when training to get to ultra low body fat content. Um, your your cardiovascular health is very important, um, but it's also very important not to overdo it. So again, more confirmation for carb backloading. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, everybody out there who keeps trying to trash it. I, I just more and more of this research is going to come out to vindicate it because in the first place, I based it on a lot of very solid 
human physiology. And this was a very, very well done study. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the number of participants wasn't that large, but uh, there will probably be more research in the future. I just want to make note. Really but I think the study also highlights the difficulty in trying to get this data. I mean, oh. these people had their femoral veins catheterized <laughs> and they were doing biopsies while they're doing their exercise. I mean, it was insane. So, and, yeah, even if you look at the I, exercise. I mean, it's really, really good study, but it also it typifies how difficult it is to actually kind of pin some of this stuff down because it's difficult to find subjects for this type of stuff. Yeah, exactly. We talked about that with uh, Dr. D'Agostino. Or actually, I did. I don't think you were on that one. Where are you, Rocky? I don't think so. Yeah, we had, we had talked about the cost of research and how difficult it is. And, and just a note to tell everybody, you generally when I conduct research, I have never offered compensation to people, so it's purely on a volunteer basis. So, I mean, getting poked with needles and, and doing two hours of a kicking exercise at 40% VO2 max, most people, for no compensation, doesn't sound very good. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't do it. I mean, I, I would actually, I would pay somebody to do it. I would volunteer and then pay somebody to take my place. <laughs> Just so there would be another test subject. <laughs> so what what one do we want to tackle next? What's this I one? like the wheat study. Uh, yep. well, not really a study, but the review, the meta-analysis. Yeah, that's, uh, that's actually the one Alex just handed to me. So does anybody want to lead in on that? Because you know I'll just, you know I love to talk, so... Oh, I mean, basically, this is kind of a review. Um, it was actually an interesting journal. It was like in the, a journal of serial research. So, That's you know, the best title conspiracy ever. theory goes up, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and you want to make sure the, these people are not associated with the serial industry. And there were no conflicts of interest in the study, but it, and it wasn't really necessarily a study as it was a review of the literature. Um, and one of the things they really kind of took down is they took down um, – Dr. David, William Davis, is it William Davis who wrote Wheat Belly? Yes, um, yes. They, they, you know, they took down a lot of the things that he was purporting and what he's been interviewed at with in terms of um, the legitimacy of the claims he makes in his book and in the interviews he does. It actually um, made him look, I don't have, I, I was going to say, I think it made him look really kind of either stupid or purposefully uh, promoting propaganda. It's One of the two. Well, it's, it's this. Yeah. They're yeah. exactly that. They're claims. There's there's not very much science to back anything that he says. Right. Go on go on with your your rant, Rocky. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, well, you know, and it, I think it also typifies I, I I think it was a fairly balanced article because they did it, you know, I, I think they talked about the incidence of celiac disease is very small and the this incidence of uh, gluten sensitivity is not as great as what we think it is. I mean, I think they quoted that maybe there's a 10 to 30 percent instance no, it, possibly it was, of gluten it fi Five to ten percent. Um, five to ten percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, and but they did say that you know there there are these patients that exist, and it might be worthwhile, you know, doing a diet off gluten to see if they um, improve, um, particularly in those patients who have IBS. Oh, that's what it was. About 10 to 30 percent of patients that have IBS have gluten sensitivity. Is what it was. Right. Um, right. I think, and, and then they were also talking about a couple of other interesting factors that may be confounding in terms of causing symptoms. They talked about um, this amylase trypsin inhibi uh, inhibi is it inhibitor. I don't, yep. again, I don't have the yep. article in front of me. So, so they, they talked about these ATIs as a possible mediator as well. Um, so, you know, I, again, I, I, they took four points from uh, wheat belly and basically to, to, you know, basically invalidated it because there was no science and there was actually science just contrary to what what he was purporting. They talked about um, the genetically modified wheat versus um, um, the way wheat's been grown over the last 9,000 years. And honestly, the, a lot of the more wild species of wheat actually has more gluten and protein in it right. compared well, to the newer one. It was interesting because, I, you know, one thing I didn't realize is that's one of the crops, that's one of the genetically modified crops that is not sold for U.S for uh, human food products. The study pointed that out as well. That's, you know, corn, soybeans, things like that. But wheat, genetically modified wheat, is not a component of our diet. So it's like that, that part of his, his argument is total BS. I'm trying to wonder where these claims really even came from. Well, I don't know. You know, even, even his point about how wheat creates these uh, op opioid agonists and it's addictive and it just makes you want to eat more 
you know, they even went through the research and showed, okay, here, here is the chemical that is an, uh, potential opi- opioid agonist and it's formed in the gut and it turns out that it cannot pass through the gut. You cannot absorb right, so this they're chemical. Not even, they're not even absorbing the system. So right. And they're they, not even present in the serum. And that data came from animal data. And, in, 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 uh, and so obviously that doesn't translate to humans, obviously, a lot of the time. Right. And, and the animal data they used, they were looking at infusions. Just like you said, they were infusing this chemical directly into the bloodstream. So you, you cannot make those general broad claims like he's doing. I mean, the more I read in this review, I was just like, wow. This is one of the worst, you know, one of the most incriminating reviews I've ever seen of somebody's work. Even, you know, uh, the Zone Diet, Barry Sears, when they critiqued the science behind his, I mean, I think his is, this is worse than when they kind of raked Barry Sears over the coal in the research. I, I think this is something that, that if you're a paleo person, um, I think that everybody should read this. It's only like eight pages long. It's it's not a hard read either. It's not too sciencey, but it's a it's a paper well worth reading. Um, and 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 it's certainly like I said, it was I thought it was at least fair balance in the, in the sense that it wasn't negating the issue. There certainly are people that have some issue right. with this, but it's probably not the majority of people out there, and it's probably not the smoking gun that we think it is. Well, yeah, I think this is a classic example of avoid, avoiding the elephant in the room and focusing on the minutia. Right, because it's the carbohydrates. I mean, it really is. We know that at this point. It's the carbohydrate load. And this review actually helped to back that up because it showed if you replace refined wheat products like white bread with their whole grain counterparts, even the whole grain wheat, then we saw greater. We saw some weight loss. We saw some help with weight control. Uh, we saw some help with blood sugar control, with diabetes control, which again, when you include the whole grains... The magic there is that you're getting less of that refined carbohydrate, which means you're getting more fiber. So there, there's less usable carbohydrate in those foods. So oh. the paper even actually points in that direction, the, the review does. I also like to give a shout out to the, uh, the fermentation process because you do get those salubrious or healthy um, short chain fatty acids. Right. Which the body actually reabsorbs and can use. Right. Yeah, we actually talked about it on our recent podcast oh, with did you? Uh, Brain. Okay. Uh, because of um, preferred fuel for the brain for astrocytes specifically that like short chain fatty acids. Okay. Uh, and something else very interesting in this review is that it pointed out to date there's only been one double blind randomized placebo controlled study on gluten sensitivity where they took the two groups and one group had gluten secretly added into the diet. And the other group did not. They made sure both groups did not have IBS or celiac. And, but they did have reports of gluten sensitivity. So they, they run this study, and there was absolutely no difference between the two groups, the one that had gluten added into their diet and the one that didn't. And there's only one study in, at, at this moment that looked at that, a double-blind uh, placebo controlled and the gluten made no difference whatsoever. And we've talked about that on this show before. Um, gluten, more and more research is coming out and there's more and more reasons to believe that gluten is really not even something to bat an eye out, uh, bat an eye at. Yep. I think the, uh, the other thing they also did mention in, in, uh, in, in the study was, or in the article was that um, one of the other confounding factors possibly could be masking would be some of the food mop sensitivity. So, you know, if, if you're more sensitive to the, like the fructosaccharide and things like that. So they had mentioned that also as a, as a possible confounding aspect too. Yeah. So. Yeah. It was interesting. Uh, there, there's more than just gluten and the gliadin fractions in wheat that you could be allergic to. Um, but again, you know, it, it might come down to, very specifically, you're just sick. People are sick. They can't handle that extra plant toxin load that they that should be handleable if they were healthy. Um, and again, the the elephant in the room is carbohydrates. I mean, just end of story. Easily accessible starches, and I don't care if they're from potatoes or white bread. Uh, too much easily absorbed starch is not going to do you any favors. 
So what you're saying is by eating the large gluten-free Domino's pizza, I'm really not doing myself any yeah, favor. <laughs> no, unless you're car backloading, and then you might be. So uh, I think... Or carb nighting. Or, or carb nighting, right? Or, right, or carb nighting, yeah. Uh, using one, one of the protocols in some way. Bye. Thanks. Yep, uh, that that was Rocky. He's got to sign off. Unfortunately, he's only here for half the show today. Uh, so Alex and I are going to take over for the last last few. So thanks for being on, Rocky. And apparently he already left. All right, so what's our next? What do we got? We got weed out of the way. We got glycogen. We got butter. So uh, Let's go over the order of concurrent endurance and resistance training. Uh, that one was it. Was kind of is is that the uh, so this went over mTOR signaling? Oh yeah, yeah. sorry, I was I was thinking of the other one for muscle memory. Do you want to go over that one? Uh, no, we'll well we can just go over it real quick because it's kind of like a news blurb. Okay, well let's go the let's go over. Uh, yeah, we'll just we'll just do the news blurb basically on muscle memory. No, what do you want to do? This is the concurrent training. Right, right, yeah, no. but I I think we should just do the. Because it kind of, the if we talk about the muscle okay, memory, it sure, kind of sure. flows into this one a little bit. Sure. So it was, I, the, he was handing me the paper and, and I remember <laughs> it's it it really basic. You know, we, we've known about muscle memory and training effect and uh, what we would call in physics, the hysteresis effect of training. So if you had trained previously and you've taken some time off and you begin training again, you get a very rapid increase in strength and you regain your size very rapidly a lot of authors use this to unfortunately trick people into believing that they've got some magic formula for gaining muscle mass when they claim they gain 30 pounds of muscle in a month but what they don't tell tell you is that they actually lost 25 to 30 pounds of muscle and then started working out for a month and regained it um, and and we didn't really know what that specific effect well, was. Well, the, the thought was it was neural. Right. That's origin. what I was about to say. You know, we, But now what we're finding is because there are so many nuclei and skeletal muscle and these long fibers that once you actually develop these nuclei and these, these properties to build muscle, they stay there. So it's very easy when you come back to training um, to increase protein synthesis very rapidly because now you have the genetic coding to do so. Right. Muscle... Muscle cells are somewhat different than a lot of other cells in the body in that they have multiple nuclei per cell. Um, and what happens with resistance training is that you get an increase in the number of nuclei. And that increase lasts for, what it's say, 90 days, basically? Yeah. Yeah. So you can lay off for 90 days and still keep that increased nuclei count, which then once you start picking up training, like Alex just said, you've got all the machinery there to help you accrete muscle mass very rapidly and get back to the state that you were at. Uh, so, you know, this, this is more like a news piece. We're not really critiquing this this article. Uh, it was done in mice, and it's been missed previously because they didn't actually look at nuclei, nuclei count of the actual muscle cell in the past. Yeah, and this, this might actually, I, I'd like to see them explore satellite cells as well in, in the muscle tissue. There's a lot of research to be done in this field. Yeah, and unfortunately not a lot of interest uh, to spend a lot of money on this field. Well, the Japanese seem to enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? what's really started to drive some of this is uh, research into cachexia and um, sarcopenia, age-related yeah, age wasting. Per, yeah, particularly pertinent to, to, older, to older groups. Yeah, so, you know, hopefully we, we might see some money flowing into this vein of research uh, for those reasons, and hopefully some of the things we learn will be applicable to advanced athletes. That's always kind of the the question mark, but I think this one clearly would be applicable to advanced athletes. So what are you saying? This is not on the same level as pedometer counts for <laughs> right. community-based research? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's where all the funding's <laughs> going. So that's your little news update. We actually know why muscle memory works, and it's not just the nervous system reacclimating. It is actually that your muscles remember how big they were because of the number of nuclei that they had formed to get to that size. Very good. Yeah. What's What's next? What's this? This is the uh, the staggered training, correct? Sure. You want to go over the concurrent training? 
Or did you want to go for the wave? I thought that the concurrent training was actually staggered, where they did endurance training and then resistance. Yeah, yes, and then that's how it was designed, but I think the yeah, title, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So well, the, the, the title's stupid. Yeah. <laughs> the, the title was <laughs> The Order of Concurrent Endurance and Resistance Exercise Modifies mTOR Signaling and Protein Synthesis in Rat Skeletal Muscle. Yeah, this, this one's interesting, and we should definitely keep in mind uh, um, that this was done in rats, although a lot of skeletal muscle biochemistry does carry over from rats to humans. Yeah, and this is extremely new research. I mean, this literally came out April 1st so of this year, so this is really new research. Um, essentially, they investigated the, uh, the molecular signaling interactions that are underlying changes in skeletal muscle adaptation during concurrent training. So they had five different groups of male rats. They, were, uh, they had an endurance exercise group, a resistance exercise group, and then an endurance before resistance training, and then resistance training followed by endurance training, and then obviously a control. What I thought was really interesting with the resistance training is instead of doing volitional contractions, they actually induced this by um, neuromuscular um, um, electrical stimulation or what's, what's termed PEN, so percutaneous electrical neuromuscular stimulation. So I actually, ha- actually did a study on this at UNLV, so kind of uh, brought back some memories for me. But anyway, what that does when they use electrical stimulation is it makes everything more controlled because they can elicit the exact contraction that they want that, can, that will be more or less the same across all treatment. Right, they can normalize the force production of the muscle, basically. Right, so the, the, big, the big takeaway here what they found was there was actually some interruption in mTORC signaling when um, the last stimulus was endurance-based. So this has implications into hypertrophy. So you, ha- you basically look at training as what signal are you giving your body? And when you're done with a training, uh, training session, what you end with may have implications in what kind of signal you're giving your body. Right. That's, that's what really stuck out to me is it is the last component of your training per training session that defines what is going to happen at the molecular and signaling level in the muscle. Um, I've, I've found that to be very fascinating. So basically to break it down very simply, if you do cardio work first and then you do resistance training, then the major effect that you're going to get is that of the resistance training. Those are going to be the transcription factors that are elevated. Now, if you switch that and you do resistance training first and then cardio, the main modifications and adaptations that you're going to have are that from the cardio, which means mTORC down regulation so that it limits hypertrophy. And my guess is what you would see over time is a increase in um, basically the endurance of the muscle in that regard, whereas if you did in the flip state, you would see more size gains. Yeah, so this, this study was done on the acute scale, but definitely these results could be summated over time to something more chronic. Uh, and I, I really think this ties into training targets. So, I mean, when we talk about how, I mean, partic- we could probably tie this in a little bit to CrossFit per se. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to, when you look at training, you have to have certain goals in mind and you have to direct training towards, I mean, this is the basis for periodization. You can only have a certain number of training goals or training targets. You can only develop a certain amount at a certain time. You can't keep giving conflicting signals and expect to be master of everything. It's just not going to happen. And I think the study, at least in rats, kind of validates that point. Yeah, we've got it. They call it the um, acute interference hypothesis, which is basically... Basically, what the hypothesis says is that any training paradigm that says that you can do all things all at once and be incredible at all of them all at the same time is stupid. Uh, It's basically what the hypothesis says. And we've got tons and tons of research um, supporting that and very little research to refute it at this point. There may be one area where you could you could kind of modulate that. But even then, it's not optimal. It's called training residuals. Um, Vladimir Ishrin, he's, he did a lot of research with periodization, but then again, you have, you're looking at rates of detraining. Um, it's, it becomes a very complex system to work with, but for, for most people, when we talk about adding mixed exercise, you have to be cognizant of what training target you want or what you're trying to, what you're trying to basically have your body adapt to. You're sending it, basically training is a series of messages. What are you sending it? 
what <laughs> that's going to dictate the outcome. We we've talked about that. That's uh, the the term I usually use for that is modulated tissue response. So you can elicit a certain response in one type of tissue while limiting that response in another type of tissue, and you can do that simultaneously. Uh, and, and that's basically what we're talking about here. It's like, what signal are you trying to induce? And trying to induce too many adaptations at once, uh, particularly adaptations that are contradictory, are basically just going to screw up your results, period. And probably this might be, see, be why we see such a high rate of injury in CrossFit is the body doesn't really know how to recover. You know, you've you've given it so many paradigms to try to recover from, it may just not be able to recover sufficiently at all. And so that just builds up. It's not just the stress of all this other exercise. It's also the competing influence of this exercise on what your body is trying to decide to recover from. And, and this is happening on multiple systems, neural, um, molecular, oh, yeah. I mean, and all the tissues. I mean, it, there's just nothing good about it I, I at least I don't see it yeah uh, the, it's it's hard to say there's nothing good about CrossFit only because the community is so well, strong. I wasn't talking yeah. about CrossFit in particular I was talking about these mixed forms of exercise oh well that's CrossFit <laughs> <laughs> I, guess, I mean I nothing else that exemplifies way, sure. that kind of lack of programming and trying to do everything at once as much as CrossFit I don't think there's ever been anything historically to epitomize that sort of weird philosophy as CrossFit. I mean, I just, yeah. I just don't think there is. I always say about CrossFit, it really doesn't know what it wants to be and it doesn't know how to get there. Right. It's, they just want to be better. They just don't know what that means is the problem. Um, and, and they've been given this prescription that has not been thought out at all. And contrary to everything we're seeing with injury rates and, um, you know, metabolic issues that people are suffering, you know, weight gain problems that they have uh, from being overstressed constantly, you know, all these things we're seeing. Contrary to that, there's just not been a slowdown in the momentum. And I think that's just because the community is so powerful. It's become some people's church. Um, and, and that's what we really need to leverage. Like, I don't hate CrossFitters. You know, I think CrossFitters are, I, you know, highly commendable. They're hardworking people. Yeah, they bust their ass to be better every day, and you have to respect that. I don't. I don't think there's any way you can't respect that. What What I don't respect is how it's directed. I suppose. I mean, it's imagine how much how much they could accomplish if it was directed in the right direction. Right. It's it's that upper echelons. It's the it's CrossFit HQ as they call it. That's the problem, um, and that's what I very much dislike. Is you know they're just refusal to look at anything that's actually going on in the community they just bury it they bury it as much as possible and they just don't talk about it it's like oh no that kind of stuff doesn't happen um even though chiropractors uh, massage therapists it's keeping a lot of yeah, people in business buddy. yeah it is it's exactly. big business they're very excited about it so we we can move on that's so we've, i think we're done trashing crossfit for now for now so so the key is if your main goal is hypertrophy you need to do your cardio before resistance training. And this, or separate. Yeah, or separate. This, this might go contrary to previous recommendations that I made, and I need to go back and look at uh, some of the research on the hit cycles and when to put them around your resistance training. Uh, I can't remember. It, it seems like they were the hit cycles were supposed to come after the resistance training for some of the effects that were shown. Um, I'm going to have to go back and review that to try to uh, put put all this into the same context to really figure that out. But essentially, this study says whatever the last thing you do is, that's going to be the major adaptation that you have. And from a molecular perspective, that makes total sense. Yes. Yes, it does. All right. Moving on. Yeah. That one. Oh, I'll, I'll let you... Actually, didn't get a in. chance to read this one. I'm working oh, on comps this week. <laughs> of course, it's the one you don't read. Yeah, the one I don't read. The whey protein study. Uh, you know, it's I... It's basically just an, a meta-analysis. It was. Uh, one thing I liked is their selection criteria for studies to include was very tight. Um, it was much better than just saying, hey, we're going to take everything that used whey protein and lump it together and do a meta-analysis, which was 
Um, yeah. Basically, the Aragon approach recently. I'm assuming it was just, they were looking at a pretty heterogeneous selection, and that was the problem with with with, with all the with the all the Aragon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They lumped so much together. Um, you know, basically on both sides, they had an equal number of null responses and then an equal number of positive responses. And when you average those out, essentially, which is what a meta-analysis is, they just got no information. They didn't get anything negative. They just got he no actually, information. He didn't publish a meta-analysis, did he? Uh, his name's on one. He didn't do the meta-analysis. He doesn't have that kind of sophistication. Okay. Uh, they, they had a statistician. Uh, again, work. just because something's published, and I see this so often with the stats, a lot of people in these sciences, they don't have any formal education in stats. And you can actually look at the statistical analyses, and they're totally inappropriate for the study. So just because something's published doesn't mean it should be published. Right. It was in the uh, Journal of the International Sports. Oh, okay. An impact yeah. factor of nothing. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, I, I have to admit, they do have some very interesting and clever research in that journal from time to time. Um, but as far as the scientific community is concerned, it's it does not have a lot. It's of It's not impact. on the radar, right? But for strength coaches, um, it is. You know, it's one of their top top uh, journals that they like to look at, which might tell you something because strength strength coaches are not looking for the same type of validity or confirmation that other research that researchers are looking for. Well, they're they're in the trenches and they need information yes. fast. Yes, exactly, exactly. So the, this meta-analysis, um, really, it, it did not confirm, in my mind, it did not confirm whether whey protein is necessarily um, beneficial for either muscle gain. It, that whey protein, compared to other types of protein, is beneficial for muscle gain or fat loss in comparison to other types of protein. Um, because basically what they found was that in the studies with whey protein where they broke it down into studies that just supplemented with whey protein. So they actually added whey protein to the diet. Um, and then they compared that with studies that actually replaced some other macronutrient with whey protein and kept the caloric load the same. Um, and what they found was after they, you know, adjusted for confounding factors and whatever, they're, they're really isn't a huge difference. Um, basically, if you replace some macronutrient with protein, whether it's whey protein or another protein source, you get you start to see some fat loss. We've known this for actually a long time. Uh, that's not new, and whey protein did not perform any better than any other type of protein. Uh, so there, there's no magic there to whey. Uh, and got to find my notes because I remember there was one interesting point. Sorry for the pause. And we will try to randomly talk so that it's not that dull. Oh, man, of course. So, I didn't finish off my... So do you, do you have that? Yeah. No, I mean, do you, do you remember that point of um, what they found with... It was in the supplementation group. So it wasn't in the group that replaced... Um, Are you talking about in conjunction with weight training? Yes, yes, that's yeah. what it was. They did see greater muscle accumulation, correct? Yes, yes. That was the conclusion of the meta-analysis. Yes. I just read the abstract. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what, what they did find is that, you know, adding whey protein compared to other protein sources had greater amount of muscle gain in comparison to the other proteins, but, you know, it barely reached st statistical significance. So, again, whey protein might confer an advantage. It's hard to say. Uh, they did look at whey protein isolate, concentrate, and hydrolysates. Oh, really? They looked at yeah, all okay. they did look at all three. So that could actually be a confounding factor because uh, we know the hydrolysates absorb very differently than the other two forms. Um, so that could have been confounding in there. But uh, basically, you know, what I would say is this supports the conclusion at the moment that what is most important in gaining muscle mass when you're training is increased pro dietary protein, uh, which was es essentially the result of the uh, Aragon Schoenfeld review slash meta-analysis uh, that they did. 
Um, but again, this ignores so much information. It's still one of those we don't know. We don't have enough information, and this meta-analysis is another example of that. We don't have enough information uh, to apply this to meal timing and recovery. Um, all we can say is this is another confirmation that if you're going to grow new muscle mass and your resistance training, you need more protein in your diet. End of story. And whey protein may be more beneficial than other forms. By, by, a, mar- by a small margin. By a small margin. Like I said, it, it barely reached statistical significance in the, the difference between the two. But it, it was... It, yeah, and I, I mean, just looking at the, the numbers here, I mean, there was... They did a meta-analysis of only 14 randomized controlled trials. So See, that's what I thought was interesting, though, because their selection criteria yeah, it was, was pretty very strange, tight. Which was good, which yeah. is good, but we just, <laughs> like, we always want more research. Yeah, it, it wasn't, and, and that's, that actually should be a good lesson. I mean, how many, I can't remember how many articles they said they pulled for their review. It was a lot. Yeah, it was a lot. It was a lot for that review, but this one, I mean, they could barely find very many uh, research articles to meet their criteria. They had very tight criteria criteria because they were looking for very specific pieces of information, which is usually what a meta-analysis is for. You don't take a meta-analysis and group 100 studies together and you already know that half of them are null and half of them are positive. You know you're going to get a null result. Usually what you're looking for is the common factor in those positive studies or the common factor in those negative studies. You want to know, okay, what was the factor that made this a null outcome? Or in these, what was the most prominent factor that caused a positive result? And then that leads you on to the ability to formulate what the next best test is. Uh, doing a meta-analysis where that's just junk, that's just like, let's and throw there, everything together. There are a lot of them. Yeah, and they don't tell you anything, unfortunately. They don't tell you what direction to go. Uh, that, that's why I think it was a, a shame... You know, they did a lot of work and they did obviously look at a lot of research on protein and uh, protein intake and timing and so on and so forth. And they should have been able to really create distinct categories of exactly what studies fit into what paradigms and then done a much more powerful comparison um, that, that probably would have or could have more accurately applied to their point. Um, I mean, I can't say how that meta-analysis would turn out. Maybe their point is correct that protein timing doesn't matter, um, but they should have tried to categorize that body of research they were looking at better in order to address that question specifically. Good advice. Yeah. Um, But, you know, what do I know? Nothing. Yeah, I just, (laughs) you know, spent, oh my gosh, wait... Way too many years in the physics community uh, looking at research and statistics. And there, your entire career rides on, did you do the right statistical test or did you do the right mathematical analysis? Yeah, there's nothing fun getting ridiculed in, a, in, in front of a panel of <laughs> experts. Oh, well, I mean, you, just, you know, if you think about the physics world, literally you might spend anywhere between, you know, not considering just the coursework you need to do, you're going to spend possibly anywhere between two to six years collecting data. So if you screw up with that statistical analysis, you just blew six years of your life. Um, and that's happened. That's happened to some of my friends. You know, they just totally screwed up. That's why physics was very heavy. We did a lot. We did an asinine amount of statistics stuff, you know, in those first couple of years, which was just anno- pretty much annoying stuff because these days you just plug it into the computer. Well, it teaches you to be a stickler, and it makes you look at research in a whole different way. It does, very much so. Uh, and, it, and it's funny when you get attacked for some of the conclusions you make based on pieces of research. And they're like, oh, well, this was done in animals. It's like, well, you know, read the study. They actually did a very good statistical analysis, and we know certain correlations do exist between animal skeletal muscle and human skeletal muscle. So we Right, and then a lot of people don't understand a lot of this research <laughs> is to help direct further research in human populations. You can't, exactly. a, lot of, a lot of this stuff, you cannot go out and start performing on humans. It's just not going to happen. You're not going to get through an IRB. Right. You, and, and that's the whole point of all of this research. Even the research done on humans is not 
you know, everybody should be excited actually about a negative result. If you do a study and you get an outcome that's not what you expected, that's actually good. That tells you another direction that you should start looking. Well, the unfortunate problem is publication bias. And right now this is huge in the scientific community. So if someone will do a study and they get a null result, they won't publish. Um, and, and it's almost, um, you know, it's almost a crime, I think. It is because null result is a very important result. And well, it, not only that, but now that it's not in the community, other researchers right, could conduct you, the exact same research right. and just waste all that resource and all that time. It's really a disservice to the scientific community in every regard. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then you have the opposite categorization of people who will keep testing a hypothesis over and over and over again, hoping that they're going to get a positive result. And one of my favorites was this was a show on human longevity and lifespan. And they had on a, re a researcher. I can't remember what her name was. She was in Europe, um, but she was a very dedicated vegan. And she was researching <laughs> that. I know these types. Yeah, vegetarian and vegan diets would correlate with an increased lifespan. And while they're interviewing her, she said, well, you know, we've looked at all this data, blah, blah, blah. She's talking about, and we haven't found any connection yet, but we're going to keep looking until we do. That is not science. That is not science. That is somebody who is That's on, dogma. Yeah, that is somebody who's on a mission to be right no matter what. And they're going to keep skewing the data and they're going to keep running bad statistics or throwing out certain parameters until they get the result they want. If you ever hear a researcher say, well, we're going to keep looking until we get the answer we want, that is somebody you never want to look at their research. You never want to pay any attention to them. And don't think this isn't a big problem right now. No, it's, it's huge. huge. Yeah, it's huge. <laughs> Even in, you know, and it's, it spans different fields of research. Um, it spans physics. It spans. It's really bad in nutrition. I'll tell you that right now. Yeah, it's, it's really bad. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's something that is just. You know, it's that confirmation bias that humans look for. You know, they they want to be right, and they see little glimpses of being right here and there. And so they're going to chase it, and uh, they end up chasing their tail, unfortunately, wasting a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of brilliance. I mean, these people are not are not stupid. I mean, some of them are, are very brilliant researchers, and it's a shame that they won't put their talents to better uses. Well, that's society's loss, I suppose. It is. Um, but it's a loss we won't be able to afford for much longer because people are just getting so damn sick. Yep. But anyway, I think that's it. We've hit an hour and, uh, we can tell that we hit an hour because Cooper is wandering around waiting for me to feed him now, uh, at the recording studio. And my leg is asleep, so. Oh, well that could, that could be another, <laughs> another indicator. So Cooper, if people don't know, uh, he, he's my unofficial mascot, a uh, little corgi. Corgi pup. He appeared once on somebody's video podcast. Uh, I, I can't remember what it was. Fit, fat, fat to fit HQ. I think uh, he popped up on there once. But maybe we'll get a picture of Cooper up for the show one of these days. All right, uh, that's another another episode of Body IO FM. Thanks, Alex, Alex Moore, for being on the show and uh, contributing his research experience. Thank you for having me. Yep, and uh, we've actually got some uh, what I think are going to be some exciting announcements about podcasts coming up here in the future, and they directly relate to Alex. So we will keep you updated with that, and we'll catch you next time. You've been listening to Body IO FM with your hosts, Kiefer and Dr. Rocky. If you'd like to hear more, log on to body.io. We'll be back next time with more science from the pinnacle of human health and performance.